We're continuing our series here on, on Walk the Walk, and uh, I want to say again, I said this last week, uh, you know, if you're here listening this morning, if you're listening online, uh, welcome you to the conversation, because again, I found out that there's a, a number of people who are listening online, and that's, that's a, a tremendous honor that uh, for anyone, <laughs> you guys here, anyone online listening to, to listen to what I'm saying, um, I take it pretty seriously. I think it's a tremendous responsibility and try to, try to do so in a way that is encouraging to you, uh, that is meaningful and, and very practical. Because it's one thing to talk about stuff and have this great information in our head, but then we kind of go, eh, what are we going to do with it? Um, so I want to provide things that are helpful and that are, are practical to you. And, and remind everyone, whether you're a Christian or not, that this, this whole series is for you. And it's, it's for you because, uh, as I mentioned last week, everyone wants their life to be better. Whether you're Christian, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Muslim, Hindu, uh, atheist, agnostic, you're one of those people that when you fill out a form, what's your religious preference and you check none, uh, everyone wants their lives to be better. And so this lesson is for you because I don't, I don't want to just sit up here and tell you something that you're like, well, I'm not going to use that, or that's nice information, but what do I do? I'm trying to give you, and myself, because I learn a lot from working these lessons up, uh, practical steps that can make, uh, really, that can make your life better, that can make our world better. And we've got to do that practically. We've got to do that with actionable things that we can do, not just ways that we think, but things that we actually go and do. Um, we've got it, you know, it's more than just talking about it, because talking, talk is cheap, right, we say. Uh, it's more than just thinking about it, it's actually walking this walk that leads to a better life. And I know that's kind of a big, that's a big, uh, big statement to make, a big guarantee. Well, David's going to tell us how to make our lives better, how to make the world a better place. But I do think the reality is, and this isn't all my information, like I, I came up with all this, um, there's a lot of research behind this. There's a lot of, um, a lot of history behind this. Uh, so today's topic is, is going to be kindness. We're going to be talking about kindness. Last week, we talked about patience, and it was great to see. I saw some posts on Facebook about patience. Uh, uh, Josh and Kelsey sent me a little video of them waiting on the train to go by. And it's funny, when they send it to us, Cher and I were standing in a line at Lowe's. We're like, yeah, patience. <laughs> uh, and, and I think I, yeah, I had posted, one of the examples I gave was like getting behind a slow driver. It's like having patience with them. It's like, I have been behind more slow drivers since I said that than I think I ever have in my whole life. It feels like everywhere I went, I was behind a slow driver. And God's like, yeah, you said patience, so let's... <laughs> let's, let's see if we can get your patience up, uh, up to par. Um, so kindness, what, what is kindness? Just looking at the definition of it, most of us probably go, yeah, I know what kindness is. Um, it's having a good or benevolent disposition to have goodwill towards another person. Uh, it's the quality of being generous, considerate, and, or friendly. The quality, and I like that really, that last word the best, the quality of being friendly. Being kind is being friendly. I think sometimes we think we're kind, but we're not being friendly, right? Being kind is being friendly. So anywhere today you can substitute friendliness for kindness or being a friend for being kind. Now for, for Christians who are part of this or listening to this, the, the New Testament, again, speaks of love and often includes this attribute of kindness in connection with love. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind. In Colossians, um, clothe yourselves with kindness. Galatians, the series that we just got done with, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness is one of those. Romans 12 uses this practice hospitality. That's, that's an act of kindness. And so for Christians, the call to be kind is, is part of who we're supposed to be. It's part of, as a Christian, I am to be loving, and to be loving, I am going to be kind. I'm going to be friendly to people. And we probably all know of occasions when it seemed like I, this person I thought was a Christian, or 
people talk about Christians being hypocritical and things like that because like, well, what happened to the kindness? Well, I didn't get a lot of kindness from that person who I thought was a Christian, and that does give Christians a bad name. I mean, let's be honest, right? People aren't kind to you who you think or who they have professed to be a Christian and they're not kind to you. It kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth, right? But also for non-Christians, guess what? For non-Christians, kindness is good for you too. (laughs) Uh, We'll talk about it in a few minutes, but even if you're not a Christian, kindness is good for you because kindness is good for everyone. So first, let's talk about what gets in the way of kindness. It seems pretty, you know, we, we would think about it and go, well, just kindness is, we'll just be kind. We'll be friendly. No big deal. Y- y'all know Sharon and I are both from Texas. As, as, you, drive in, as you drive into Texas, the highway uh, has a big sign that says, like, welcome to Texas, little Texas flag. And then right in under it, it says, drive friendly the Texas way or whatever. I'm like, I've driven past a lot of people in Texas, that we're not driving very friendly. Um, I don't need a bad word to Texas, but it, it is difficult. It can be difficult sometimes to be friendly, to be kind to people. And, and here's the main reason why it's called the fundamental attribution error. That's a hard fundamental attribution error. So here's, here's a little bit of a complicated uh, definition. The fundamental attribution error is. It's a social psychological phenomenon where people tend to blame internal characteristics, internal character flaws on someone else's behavior rather than some external force. Right? They look at this person and they say, inside them, inside their character, there's something wrong. That's why they're behaving this way. But when we look at ourselves, we don't do that. We do the opposite. So it's like, if, if I'm late going somewhere, if, if I'm late going somewhere, then I attribute that to, uh, I'm, I'm a good father, and I was spending time with my kids, time got away from me a little bit, and so I was, I was late, but I'm a good father, and that's, that's why I was late. Or some other external force that, that I don't have much control of, I, I got a flat tire, I can't help a flat tire, this thing, or deer ran out in front of me, whatever it may be, and, and I'm late because this external force on me prevented me from doing or or being where I should have been, right? The external, what did I say? Fundamental attribution error, what we do is when someone else is late, we see it as a character flaw. That person must not be very responsible. If they were more responsible, they wouldn't be late. That person must not care, right? If if they cared more, they, they would be here on time. And so that's the thing. When we look at others, we label it as a character flaw. When we look at ourselves, we say it's some external force that, that we can't do anything about it or that's really, really positive. Uh, so like when someone runs a red light, when someone runs a red light, we immediately think that that person is, is reckless, not thinking that maybe they're rushing someone to the hospital, right? Or someone, um, we see someone kick a vending machine. We think, wow, that person really has an anger problem. But when we kick a vending machine, it's because our, you know, our food is stuck in there. We want to shake it loose. When uh, someone else, we talk about waiting in line. When, when someone is impatiently waiting in line at, at a drugstore or some other place, we attribute that, we, we say, wow, that's, that's really rude or that's really impatient or whatever. Maybe they're buying medicine for a sick child or a loved one at home that they're trying to get to them quickly to relieve whatever pain or whatever problem they're in. And so that's, that's this fundamental attribution error. Uh, Dr. Daniel Gil- Gilbert from Harvard says, we fail to search for alternative explanations for each other's behaviors. We, we, fail, we fail to search for alternative explanations. We just immediately go to the character of the person and, and start a character assault on them. And instead of saying, well, maybe, maybe it's something else. I kind of say it this way. I try to look at everybody, and for the most part, 99.9% of the people that we all encounter from day to day are reasonable people. The reasonable people. Reasonable people with, with things going on in their lives, the way they think is reasonable. You always got the 0.1% like not reasonable, right? You're being unreasonable. But for the most part, people we encounter are reasonable people, and they're behaving in reasonable ways if we knew what was going on in their lives. Uh, Ian McLaren is a 19th century uh, Scottish author, 
and he suggested this. This isn't an exact quote, but he suggested, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind, be friendly, because everyone you meet, something's going on in their life that you have no idea what it is. Just like there's things going on in your life in your mind, in your family, or whatever that you know that no one else knows about. And so it's, it's hard to, to adjust our, our perception of people if we're, if we're always labeling and always taking on a character assault on them instead of thinking, you know what, this is probably a reasonable person. And there's probably a reasonable, rational reason for why they're behaving the way they are. So what happens when we are kind? Well, number one, kindness helps us feel good. And it just doesn't help us feel good. It's like, oh yeah, kindness does help me feel good. Scientifically, what's going on in our brain and our body, being kind to people helps us feel good. There's neuroscience research at three different places, at uh, University of California in Berkeley, University of Oregon, and this, this thing that's really hard, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes. Right? So all these neuroscience people have done research on what kindness does for a person's body. And the research has demonstrated that the psychological benefits of kindness are actually reflected in the circuitry of our brain. As we're kind, our brain circuitry begins to align with feelings of goodness. Uh, we, we feel better. Uh, our brain somehow becomes aligned with this and uh, when we allow ourselves to regularly engage in acts of kindness, we create these neural pathways that enhance this sense of well-being within us. So as we're kind, and it's not like one-off kind. I could be kind, and I might feel good for a little But as we do it more and more and more, what it does is it just creates a better, more positive outlook on life. The world becomes a better place. It not only becomes a better place from our act of kindness, but in our minds, we begin to see the world as a better place. It also reduces fear and stress. And some of the same research has recorded reduced activities in the part of the brain that stimulates fear and stress responses. Uh, the Journal of Psychiatric Medicine, uh, they said that humans thrive off social connect, uh, connections, humans thrive off social connections, and they benefit when they act in the service of others' well-being. And this thing, giving targeted support to an individual in need is uniquely associated with reduced fear and stress. Giving targeted help to someone that's in need actually reduces fear and stress. So if you're feeling fearful in your life, if you have anxiety maybe, I'm not saying this is a cure to all anxiety, I'm, I'm not a medical professional, right? You'll have to see Madison for that or somebody else. Um, but the research has shown that, that stress uh, is, is reduced, that anxiety, that fear is reduced when we are behaving in ways that are kind, behaving in ways that are friendly towards other people. And the last one here is just general health. It improves general health. I was disappointed to find out that in all this research there was nothing substantial to prove that chocolate lovers live longer, right? Because I'm a chocolate lover and I'm, I'm convinced that it's going to help me live longer the more that I eat. Uh, so there's no research to support chocolate lovers live longer, but there is in this research to support that if you're kind, there's proven health benefits. Uh, just the, the total health of our body, reduced blood pressure and things like that, which we know is, is all good. Now, let me speak just for a moment about this targeted um, help. So targeted kindness or targeted help is, is hands-on help. It is, it is when I see something and I, and I go and do something. Um, it's not just seeing it, and so the opposite of this would be untargeted help. Untargeted help is like when you give to a charity, honestly, much like when we take up the collection here. And what we can get from this is targeted help is me actually going and helping a person, my activity in helping them. Untargeted is when I send money or supplies or something to something. Here's the difference. One of those has all these benefits that I talked about. The other one does not. Now, does that mean we should stop giving? No, that's not what I'm talking about. But if we're talking about this really um, making the world better through the people that we interact with and the people we connect with, making our community around here, around the River Valley area, or, of course, other places that we come in contact with, 
and the indirect benefit of how it helps us personally in my own mind and my body and my health and things like that, that targeted is, is something that, that we do to a person, untargeted is not. And it's kind of like this. You can't buy your way into the benefits of being kind. You can't buy your way into the benefits of being kind. It actually takes action on your part. All right, so that's some of, the, some of the science behind all this stuff. So how do we improve? How do we improve on our kindness, our being friendly? We're going to look at an example from King David. Uh, this will be in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, if you want to go there. Uh, but we're going to talk about King David. King David is this, this king of the land of Israel from about like 3,000 or so years ago, long, long, long time ago and long before Jesus. And if you're familiar with David, this is David like the David and Goliath David, if you're familiar with that story. This is later as he's older. I want to introduce you to a few characters in case you're not familiar with this story. Uh, so first is David. So David is King David, like David and Goliath, that same guy. He's older now. He's the king. Saul. Saul is the guy who was king before David. Uh, Saul is also now dead, All right. Jonathan is Saul's son, Saul's son, the first king's son, who is also David's best friend. They're kind of sort of like the same age. Saul's a little older. He was the first king. Uh, Jonathan's son and David were best friends. Uh, Jonathan is, is also dead. So David here now, he's the king. The first king is dead. His son is dead. Really, it seems like the whole family is dead. And then there's this guy, Mephibosheth. Now, I've looked around, and I haven't found anybody named Mephibosheth around here lately, and it's kind of a weird word to say, so we're just going to call him Mo. Does that work for y'all? All right, the names doesn't matter. What matters is, do we understand the lesson, right? So Mo, here's this guy, Mephibosheth. He is Jonathan's son, so David's best friend's son, and I think he had several, but we're going to get introduced to him, and then there's this guy, Ziba, who is a, a servant from the household of Saul. Okay, got it? That's all the players here, the major players in this, in this reading. So we're in uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel, I believe it's chapter, chapter 9. It'll be on the next slide. So David asks, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. Verse 3 the king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show kindness? Who I can show God's kindness? Ziba answers the king. He says, There is still a son of Jonathan, and he is lame in both feet. And uh, he, David says, Where is he? Ziba answers, He's in Lo Debar. Now, Lo Debar, just real quickly, if your life has gotten so bad, that you're living in a place that the town name starts with low, then you have reached the lowest of low, right? <laughs> you're, li you're living in the town that's low to bar. It's not like the greatest place around. So he lives in low to bar, uh, verse 5. Uh, so King David brings him up uh, from low to bar. Uh, when Mo, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, comes to David, he bows down to him and pays him honor. And David says, Mo! <laughs> he says, at your service, he replies. He says, don't be afraid. David says to him, For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore you, or I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. And Mo bowed down and said, What is it that your servant, that you should notice a dead dog like me? And then verse 11 says, So Mo ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. So all the rest of Mo's life, he sat there at the king's table eating as, as one of the children of the king. Now, you may not know this, or maybe you might not make this connection unless you're much of a history buff, but what David does here is very uncanny, very unusual, very, very much not the norm of something that a king in these times would do. Now, typically, which this is not the case necessarily in Israel, how are kings determined, right? Who, someone becomes king, who's the next king? Usually it's the son, right? The oldest or the oldest child, the oldest heir. Uh, and then who becomes the king after that? The next, you know, the, the oldest child of that one. And there's this, this lineage, this like dynasty we would talk about of leadership within a country. 
Well, sometimes leaderships change, dynasties change, and it's no longer going to be this family, it's going to be this family, right? And sometimes that happens with a coup, some military takeover, some riots, people uprising or something, some war and all the kings and their families die, I don't know. But typically what happens when a new family becomes king, you know what they do to anyone that's left of the old king's family? They kill them. They kill every single one of them. They kill the men, they kill the women, they kill the children. That's 3,000 years ago, right? We don't do that today, thank you. But, man, that would make elections really tough, wouldn't it? You'd be like, whoa, <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to run. <laughs> um, and, and the reason for that is so that 20, 30, 40 years down the road, this person doesn't show up and say, hey, I'm the rightful heir to the throne. I am the son of the former king, or maybe the grandson of the former king, and I am the rightful heir. And everybody goes, yeah, he's right. And now they start thinking about kicking out this king. So typically, again, this isn't what David's doing, but typically that's how things were handled if there was a change in dynasty way, way back in these ancient times. Kill off the old king's family so you never had to worry about somebody else coming and claiming the throne. But again, David doesn't do that. Um, he shows us three practical steps that we'll look at that we can take to show more kindness in our world. So we're going to take this example from somebody 3,000 years ago that typically would have killed off all potential heir-type people, but that's not what David says, right? He's looking to be kind. So the first thing that David does is he looks. David looks. He was looking to be kind, looking to be friendly. There had to be some desire, right? I mean, you wouldn't go looking unless you had some desire, so I guess you could have a little pre-step there. But to be kind first, within us, there needs to be a desire to be kind, a desire to be friendly. And honestly, sometimes there's not. Sometimes I know I'm in a rotten mood, and I really have a desire to be left alone. And if you don't leave me alone, you might get the <laughs> unintended response, right? I mean, that's, that's a reality of life. But some of it, so it, it's, it's how we think, it's, it's how we're looking at life, and, and we have to have a desire to be, to be friendly. Um, and, and why would we? Sometimes in the world, I think people would ask, why would we have a desire to be kind? Again, back to those, if nothing else, back to those benefits. I think the main one being just making the world a better place. I want the world to be a better place. I think you want the world to be a better place. We all want our lives, I talked about that, we all want our lives to be better, and kindness to other people is part of the way we get there. So having this desire. So David asks, you know, is there someone I can be kind to? Uh, he takes the initiative, and he wanted to know if there's anyone left in this house of Saul. And, you know, the only way to find that thing that doesn't just fall in your lap is to go looking for it. We, we can sit around and be idle and just wait for a kindness opportunity to just fall in our lap when someone carrying a bag of groceries, walking two steps in front of you, the bag explodes and everything falls out, and we, you, know, you instantaneously and instinctively just go to help them. Right? That's one that's just fallen in our lap. And, and those, those are just going to come naturally. What I'm talking about here is going above that and having an intent to look for opportunities to be kind. So number two, uh, David takes notice. Now, logically, David calls Zilba. He calls a servant in. Uh, his search is legitimate. It is detailed. And we can be searching, too, and we can be looking, but oh, really, if we don't take notice... Because sometimes, too, in the taking notice step, I think maybe we see something, but then we kind of we write it off. We kind of go, well, they're probably okay. You know, they, probably, they probably don't need our help. Maybe it's not as bad as I think it is or whatever. But noticing that, hey, here's an opportunity for me to be friendly to someone, to be kind. And again, why am I doing this? Because this is part of how we make the world a better place. This is how we make my life better. It's going to make their lives better, and indirectly, it's going to make other people's lives better around us. Um, so he, he notices, you know, Zil, Ziba uh, reveals that Mo, uh, Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson, uh, and this is new information, because Jonathan, or David, thought everyone was dead. I mean, he's asking the question, because he's like, is everyone, really, is everyone in the house of Saul gone? Is there no one else that... I can show kindness to for the sake of my best friend. 
who I know he's gone, and I know his father's gone. Is there no one else left? And it turns out, well, yes, there is. Um, you know, it's like a, just an example of looking and noticing. When, when Cher and I and our whole family was younger, I don't, I don't know if we only had one child then or two. Uh, we have three total, but we're typically and this is not like a ministry thing you might have noticed if, if you've been around here, that we're typically the last ones to leave. That's not because I'm in ministry. <laughs> we've always been the last ones to leave. We just kind of hang around and we want to talk to people. Well, one time we were leaving church when our kids were little bitty, and we got in the car, and we're kind of getting our stuff ready, and we start to back out because we're going to go eat with some other families or something like that for lunch after church on Sunday. <laughs> we kind of we notice that our, our daughter's missing. Or we notice our, our daughter's not here. Did she... You didn't get her. I didn't get her. Did she go with somebody else? No, I don't think so. So I'm like, well, I'll go back in. I get my key out to the church building, go unlock the door, go look around, and there she is, asleep on one of the pews, right where she's been through the whole service, right? And so she's asleep on this pew, and we're like, oh, you know. But if I would have never noticed, I would try to imagine what my child would have done if they woke up to a dark building, everyone's gone, the doors are locked, they probably would have freaked out, right? And she was young. She was really, really young. Um, but, you know, if we wouldn't have ever noticed, we would have just left the opportunity of having our child with us, <laughs> you know. Who knows where she'd be right now, right? Number three, uh, David acted. So kindness is more than looking for our opportunities to be kind, and it's more, obviously, than noticing. Kindness is an action word, just like we talked about patience last week. A lot of times we think patience is not acting. No, patience is choosing to act in positive ways. Kindness is kind of the same way, but kindness is definitely an action word. Kindness in your mind without any action is not kindness. That's just a good thought is what we call that. I had a good thought the other day. Nothing ever came of it, right? Action is, is what's needed for kindness to really be. And, and remember, too, we, I mentioned this last week, the way to move information from our minds to our hearts, where we internalize it, it becomes part of who we are, the way to move that information from our mind to our heart is through our hands and through our feet. It's through action. We can think about things, we can theorize about things, we can have logical discussions about things, but as long as it only resides in our mind, it is not really a part of who we are. It's just something that we think. Kindness is an action word, and to move this idea of making the world a better place from our mind to our heart, we've got to take action with our hands and our feet to be kind to other people. So David acted. He, he brings Mo up from Lodabar, um, and where he could not come up, the scripture says, where he could not come up uh, for himself. Mo couldn't just walk up to the palace, bang on the gate, and say, hey, I demand all the stuff that belongs to my grandfather that's rightfully mine. I mean, he, he probably could have, but the results from that would have not been good. And again, back in these ancient times, they're like, oh, you're an heir to the, you know, archers on the tower, you know, and uh, they might try to take him out. Uh, and also, in this case, uh, I don't think it's that significant to the story, but, but Mo had, was, was crippled in some way. He couldn't, he couldn't walk, right? And so David had to take this action upon himself. One of the other things, just kind of a side note, relating to this whole killing other dynasties off thing, is David also, in his act of kindness, uh, notices this need to relieve Mo of his fears, right? He's being called up to the castle. I don't know if it's really a castle, probably wasn't, but he's being called up to where the king is, and I mean, if I was the grandson of the former king, maybe the only one left in my whole family, knowing how kings tended to handle things, and I'm being, you know, they said they summoned him. I don't know that, I always think that's a little detachment of soldiers goes down and goes, hey, you've been ordered by the king to come up here and talk to him, and like, great, you know, <laughs> and you march back up there, and you're probably, probably going to die, right? But David tells him, he, he tells him to not be afraid. He says, don't be afraid. I'm not, you know, I haven't brought you up here to harm you. What I've brought you up here for is to be kind to you because of my love for your father, right? Um, so uh, I'm sure he was much relieved, just like I was relieved when I found my, my daughter. Um, so here kind of start to wrap this up. This is very similar also to last week when we talked about patience in regard to we tend to have more patience with people who have more power than us. Right, you remember that? People who have more power than us 
in whatever, whether that's uh, academically, whether that's at uh, work, or just someone who's bigger and stronger than you, you tend to have more patience with people who are more powerful than you, and we have less patience with people who are less powerful than us, because if they annoy us, we can just swish them away because we're more powerful than them. Get out of my way, right? Uh, the same is true about kindness. We tend to be kinder to people who have more power than us. We'll be kind to them, and we want to appease them because we don't want them to use their power against us in a negative way. So we're more kind to them, but we tend to people who have less power than us, we tend to not be kind to, again, for those same reasons. So just keep that in mind as you're, as you're looking and noticing that, look, looking and noticing and about to act on opportunities to be kind, you may not be as willing to act for someone who has less power than you, but that action will still make your lives in this world a better place. I wish I could take you out into the world, hand, hand in hand, and, and show you kindness in action. Not show you, but help you experience kindness in action. And there are opportunities and things that, that you probably experience in your, in your life, but again, it's back to this. We've got to do more than just think about it. We've got to do more than just think about being kind. We've got to do more than just talking about being kind like this morning. We've actually got to take some steps. We've got to walk the walk that leads to kindness, that leads to being friendly in our lives, in our communities, with our family, wherever it is that we might, we might be. And, and here's why. This is part of this moving things from our mind down into our core being to our heart. Uh, Stadler Medical Productions, uh, production company, had a quality control issue. Um, they were sending incorrect medical supplies, incorrect material, material cut like, like tubing and things like that for surgical equipment, cut to the wrong length, uh, sending supplies, somebody to order supplies for a particular procedure or a particular patient issue and they would send them out, but they were having all kinds of errors, like not sending the right equipment. And so one of the executives decided, you know what? Let's send the people on the production line and the packing line that put all these orders together, let's send them out to some of the hospitals in the local area that, that we service. And so when they go to the hospitals, they actually got to see some of the patients who, who were like, some of the tubing that goes from the, uh, you know, when they put up like the saline bag or whatever that has that little pumpy machine thing that, that pumps it into, the tubing that goes into that, and they got to talk to some patients who or maybe they're on dialysis and some of the dialysis equipment and how much they rely on that or people who are, in, are maybe diabetic or pay, one of them talks about uh, they actually got to observe a surgery where their equipment was being used in the surgery and they got to talk to surgeons and nurses and patients and through all of this they got to experience what it's like to be on the receiving end and how important it is to get the right medical equipment for this procedure or for this patient, whatever the case may be. And this whole visit thing really just transformed the way they saw their job. The way they saw that now they had, they had a, a person in mind or they had a situation in mind. So it wasn't just stuff in a box that got sent somewhere. Instead, it was a, a set of syringes for a diabetic patient. That's, that's different than just stuff in a box or it was surgical equipment for a person who does open heart surgery or brain surgery who is like saving people's lives. What I put in this box is gonna equip this person to save someone's life. That's the kind of experiential thing that transforms how we look at things. We can just be on the assembly line of kindness and go, yeah, we'll just put some kindness in a box. We'll kind of send it on its way. Or we can go out and actually experience what kindness does to people. So, these three things, I'll just review them real quick. To show kindness, I need to look, I need to notice, and most importantly is, I need to act. Look, notice, and act. We all say those three words with me? Look, notice, and act. One more time. Look, notice, and act. Right, we're like, look, notice, and act. Get like the spirally eyes, right? Uh, this, again, this is making our world a better place. If, if we are joining with Jesus, if you're a Christian, and I, again, this, so this part, if you're not a Christian here, you can just muff your ears for a minute. 
If you're a Christian, if we are joining with Jesus on his mission, his mission to help people, we talked about it several weeks ago about Jesus' primary mission is to help people who are overwhelmed in sin because they can't help themselves, right? Jesus' mission is to make the world a better place. He is, he is on the mission of God about redeeming things, about putting things the way they're supposed to be. And if we as Christians are joining in on that mission, then we are going to act in ways that help make the world a better place. One of those ways is through kindness, through looking, through noticing, through acting. So my encouragement to you, my challenge for you for this week is to look and to notice and to take action on an opportunity in your life to be kind just to one person. It doesn't have to be a big project. You don't have to start a nonprofit. You just need to be kind to one person, one person at a time. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for blessing us. I thank you for being kind to us. I thank you that your son came and, and showed us what kindness looks like. And Lord, I know that we are, we are flawed, uh, we are weak, and typically I don't do the things that I should do, or I do the complete wrong things. Please help my life to not be necessarily an example of what everyone thinks Christianity should look like. For those who aren't Christians, who, who maybe are Maybe they're searching or maybe they're not. Please don't let me, please don't let us be unkind, unfriendly to them in ways that would, would turn them off because unkindness and unfriendliness is not what you would have for us. It's not the way you would want us to behave. Help us to give people the benefit of the doubt. Help us to be uh, looking at them as they're probably reasonable people and there's probably a a rational reason why they're behaving that way. Help us to be patient with them and help us to be kind at opportunities that we have, that we will do more than just think about it, that we'll do more than just talk about being kind, but that we'll walk the walk that shows action, kindness in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all.